If I hear no objections, I'd like to welcome all of you to our September 10th, 2020 virtual meeting of the St. Cloud City Council. Tonight's council meeting is being conducted using communication media technology as authorized by executive order of the governor during the current pandemic. We appreciate your patience and assure you that your city council remains committed to providing the public a fair and reasonable opportunity to participate in council meetings. We sincerely appreciate your continued understanding as we work through the temporary, uh, this temporary manner of conducting meetings. To tonight's meeting participants as the presiding officer, I request the following. I ask that each council member or designated staff member request that they be recognized by me before speaking and I will do my best to quickly recognize and call upon you. All participants should use the mute function and only unmute yourself when you seek to be recognized to speak and while you are speaking. Please remember that this meeting is being broadcast to the public and therefore we request that you eliminate any background distractions you may have at your location. Prior to the council taking final action on any agenda item, applicants or members of the public who are present in the public access area will be recognized to address the council. Applicants and members of the public who have pre-registered to address the specific agenda item through communications media technology will also be recognized to address the council and email or written statements that have been timely submitted will be read into the record. In the interest of time efficiency and ensuring that everyone who wishes to address the council is given the opportunity to do so, the following will apply to all comments made by the public. Each speaker will be allotted three minutes to address the council unless such time is extended by the mayor or by questions from council. Groups shall designate a spokesperson to avoid repetition of comments. Every effort will be made to avoid interrupting speakers. Once again, we thank you for your cooperation and your patience and for participating in your city government. Mayor, your video is not on. It will be in just a second. I just noticed okay. they might prefer the picture, so. <clears throat> the first thing is that we have our invocation tonight. I would like for us to stand for a moment of silence as we remember uh, those who were lost in 9-11. Uh, so could we now have a moment of silence after which we'll have our pledge. Thank you. At this time, we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> At this time, Madam Clerk, if you will, please call the roll. Mayor Blackwell. Here. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Here. Councilmember Cooper. Here. Councilmember Askew. Here. Councilmember Trace. Here. Thank you. At this time, we'll have our presentations, a presentation regarding uh, our water, an update. And, and Mr. Blackwell, um, Mayor. I just got a text from someone that the uh, feed isn't working right now. So I don't know if someone can check that out. All right. The feed on the website. Okay. Thank you. Jay, if you'll uh, try to give that your attention. Make the feed on the website. Do I need to wait any longer for that? Mr. Mayor, since yes. you're, going to be moving, you're going to be moving through presentations, I think at this point you're not doing action items, you could proceed with that. And we want All to right. make sure that the feed is up when you get to the action items. All right, thank you very much. We'll begin with the presentation regarding 
the water. Miss Marjorie Craig, I assume, will be giving this update. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Marjorie Craig, Environmental Utilities Director. And um, as we promised, every council meeting will be giving you a short update. Um, we will be getting some additional swabbing on Sunday, the 13th. Uh, we'll be doing an additional 10, almost 10 and a half miles of, of pipe. And so by the end of September, we will have done about 93 miles of pipe, which is a little over the quarter, a quarter of the water distribution system. Some of these areas we've done more than once. Um, in some areas, it, it could be up to even three, four, five times. So we target those areas in which we've had a number of complaints, the number of complaints where we've done some field testing and we find uh, any of the resin um, and where, um, uh, uh, if, if we find something that uh, in the course of, of doing something else in the field. So um, we believe we have gotten the majority of the resin out of the water, but we'll continue to clean those pipes until, uh, until we get everything done. So um, we have uh, begun, uh, we sent out letters, we have done uh, emails and we'll begin delivering bottled water to those that will be at, without water uh, when we issue a precautionary precautionary boil water notice, uh, which is required for line swabbing because we actually have to um, stop the pipe for a little while. So anytime you lose system pressure, you've got to do that. So um, we're, we feel um, like we're making a lot of progress. Um, we appreciate the support of the council and the continued uh, patience of our customers and uh, leadership. Does anyone on the council have a question? Council member Matheny. Thank you. Marjorie, thank you so much for the update. Um, could you um, give an update on the website? I understand that we are gonna have a website that comes online maybe this week that's gonna have all that detailed information. And also, can you speak to the number of complaints that we have now versus you know when this program started, just to kind of understand that Hopefully they've almost gone away. Yes, yes. Yeah, let me speak to both of them. Both good questions. Uh, the website we were hoping to have had online by um, actually by tonight, uh, and there was a slight delay because we've been dealing with some of the rain and, and the flooding events. So getting all of the, uh, we've got a timeline. We're just trying to make sure and fact check everything and make sure that it, that's up and running. So um, it'll take. Uh, it'll probably be another week. Uh, and when I get a date, I'll make sure that uh, you guys uh, get that date through through the city manager's office, of course. Um, this particular website will be a subject matter website, which will talk about the pipe cleaning, about what we've been doing, and additional, you know, you, you, you've given us direction. Uh, we're trying to provide as much information as possible. As I told you before, we're, we're used to kind of being behind the scenes and and just being able to do our, you know, but we want to make sure everybody knows what we're doing, uh, why we're doing it, and uh, what pro progress we've made. Um, what ice picking is, what the pipe cleaning methods that we're using, how much pipe we've used, uh, a map of what's been cleaned, all of that information. So that'll all be on their timeline. Um, so the second question was uh, uh, complaints. So our complaints have gone down by uh, to about a third of what they were um, uh, when we before we started uh, this pipe cleaning effort this year. Uh, and so, uh, and in fact, in some areas, we haven't had any complaints since uh, May, uh, which would, would have been right after we had conducted some ice picking and uh, some of the first unidirectional or, or the latest unidirectional and line swabbing. So um, it's, it's actually still very, um, we, we don't want any of those complaints, uh, but compared to earlier this year, uh, it's gone down by a huge amount. Great. Thank you. Um, and I got one follow up and you might not know the answer to this, but are you seeing any complaints in new areas that we didn't know about before? 
are, you know, you know, I'm just wondering if new complaints and new areas are springing up or do you feel like we pretty much have the areas contained? So one interesting uh, thing is uh, I had a, this week had a, a heat map or created to look at customer complaints and, uh, just related to water coloration. And we don't think that there are any complaints in new areas, any of the complaints that don't kind of fall within that corridor uh, of, of where we've been experiencing the complaints. Uh, we've been able to determine there was uh, hydrant flushing or some isolate some construction, broke some material loose, uh, something that caused that the complaints in that area. So the answer to that question right now is no, but if you hear something else, please, please, please let us know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I do thank you for uh, that report and that update. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions from council? Thank you, Ms. Gray. Thank you. This time we'll have a presentation regarding Osceola Heritage Park Master Plan. Uh, at least I think we are. Hi, this is Kerry Godwin. Yeah, Hi, Kerry. Trying to get it up right now. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes, sir. You see your, it says agenda. Yes. Heritage Park. Or Osceola Park. Do you see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I am Kerry Godwin, Planning and Design Director, and almost a year ago now, Mayor Blackwell had requested that the county provide a presentation to the commission regarding our um, master plan efforts for OHP. Um, so what I wanted to run over with you tonight is just the overall goals. What are the major design issues for both planning and engineering? <laughs> Give you an update on the hotel team selection and then any questions and answers. So the main thing we wanted to address with, uh, as you know, we have OHP has a very large exposure on East 192. And with the CRA, we want to address sidewalks, bike trails, street lighting, bus stops, upgraded signalization and signage, as well as future amenities such as landscaping and the street furniture. Uh, one of the directions we received is that the county even though we have uh, various consultants on board, county staff will be handling all the present public presentations. In the other direction, different from Neo City, as the parcels are to be leased within OHP, not sold. Um, one of the things we are working on is trying to coordinate the overall goals with the Neo City sign materials. And it's been placed on hold, but the design should be going forward the next fiscal year as we want to do a large entry sign at the Turnpike exit at East 192 and what is now Cross Prairie Parkway. And that would have a multimedia board with changeable copy so that we can promote events at OHP and other portions as well as be used for emergency evacuations and those types of issues. So here's the overall aerial of OHP. You see Fortune Road is on the north side. Bill Beck wraps around on the north and east, and then East 192. And, and so there's multiple facilities on there. Number one is the Silver Spurs, Silver Spurs Arena. Number two is the Event Center. Number three is KBLS. Number four is the Extension Service. Number five is SLAM Charter School, uh, who was a tenant and some existing buildings there. And then we now have Orlando City Soccer uh, that's taken over the baseball complex. And you'll see one of the fields that's been converted to soccer in this photograph, but another two or three fields have now been done. Um, Johnson University, uh, the school district board, building and gateway and all three of those partners open up their facilities for the major events to be used for parking facilities when we have overflows. 
And then number 10 is the Florida Cattlemen's Association, which is an out parcel along Bill Beck and East 192. Uh, this graphic shows the overall ownership by the county within that perimeter that I described of Fortune Road, Bill Beck, and East 192. So you'll see that the county's been aggressive purchasing the rest of the property within those boundaries, and not shown is uh, the two parcels fronting out on Fortune Road have now been also closed. Um, the other out parcel you see is an agreement with Florida, uh, University of Florida for IFAS Extension Services. Uh, and that was related to the old location of their building before all the new buildings were constructed. So the major issues we want to address is to really improve the four to five or four to six access points to include sufficient light left hand and right hand double turn lanes with additional length of stacking for major events. That, that's important for both the egress as well as the exiting. The internal section of the Shake Rag Road alignment may be realigned with the proposed internal loop road. And what we wanna do is create an internal circulation so that you can move around OHP uh, without being blocked or having to go out on a public road. And then we're also looking at maybe opening up another entrance between Bill Beck and Shake Rag Road so that we have a main entrance going in to the facility. One of the things that happens is if you're a, a visitor for the first time, don't know where you're going, it drops you off right in the middle of OHP with the address and you don't know how to get there. And so that's some of the things we're going to be working on to try to resolve. Uh, we want to include multiple staging areas for the shared driving chauffeur services for venues to reduce the on-site parking needs. And we'll consider internal bus stops or shuttle stop bus stops for conveying visitors from off-site parking as well as hopefully Kissimmee Sun Rail Station. Um, one of the things we'll be looking at and I'll show you is parking garages to allow for the lost parking areas with the proposed developments. These parking garages will be designed to have smart technology similar to some of the uh, theme parks as well as hospitals where there's identification of parking space availability. And we'll consider uh, looking at parking garages that have exterior ramps so that it's a faster exit. So we don't want our guests blocked in garages for two to four hours after an event, trying to get out and go home. Um, and then we'll be showing you the hotel locations uh, and be looking in the future for covered walkways to connect all the venues. Um, one of the things that, which you would probably have seen on the roadway, but Bill Beck is going to be extended to the north. The northern extension is being worked on right now, connecting to Osea Osceola Parkway we have an agreement with the city of Kissimmee to connect it all the way south to Fortune Road. We're also working with the schools district on a new road adjacent to Gateway High that will connect from Bill Beck Boulevard to Simpson Road so that you know there's a big backup on Simpson Road and some of that school traffic we could get off 192 and have that internal road into Gateway High. Um, Part of our study is also in coordination with our transportation and transit department and looking at the area-wide improvements uh, that they have underway. Um, our consultants have completed their task number one, which was the existing property research and what goes on. We have several new proposals from the engineering to go forward with infrastructure plans uh, a couple of things we've already resolved is number one, there is sufficient lift station capacity off site so that there's no requirement for new lift stations within the facility. And that we're also looking at moving the existing stormwater ponds off site and uh, convey that water to Neo City 
which would be expanded through the canal into their lake. Um, I kind of address some of this. With this, we'll be doing an overall master stormwater plan as well as a master utility plan. And we'll be looking at the cost of the fill for those lakes. Um, I've already addressed all of those. In December 2019, the County Board of Commissioners approved the ranking of the hotels per the selection committee and Riviera Point was selected as the number one candidate. The county manager is authorized to negotiate with Riviera Point for the development and operation of the hotels. Um, the reason why Riviera Point was selected is they just demonstrated an economic approach for four different hotel sites. They provided information on the management appro approach of having worked with public events venues for a block booking and aligning the hotel marketing to the venue marketing. And they had provided an approach that showed they understood the East 192 CRA corridor standards and they modified their site plans to meet those standards. Um, here's the introduction of the Riviera Point. Carlos Chuan is the finance and asset manager that we're working with, along with Eduardo Tessa and then they have their team there. Uh, here's their background. You have the PowerPoint. You can go in more detail later if you want to. The exciting thing about this, this is, of course, uh, projected for the four hotels when built that there would be up to 1,800 direct and indirect jobs with 300 permanent positions with salaries ranging from 45,000 to 160,000 and an hourly rates from 10 to $20 per hour. And then the other exciting thing I think is the bed tax would be with all four hotels would be about $2 million a year. And then the property taxes would be three and a half million dollars a year. So we're looking at ways that the, these facilities can pay for themselves and help support themselves within our county facilities. So there are actually four hotels. I'll start with number one and will probably be the number three hotel to be built, but it's a large conference hotel located at the corner of Fortune Road and East 192. There are two smaller hotels that would be at Bill Beck and East 192. And the fourth hotel would be within Neo City overlooking the civic space. Uh, this is kind of how it would look from a massing standpoint of the two hotels uh, along Bill Beck with a parking garage, the conference hotel um, at Fortune Road with another parking garage, and then the hotel within Celebration, which would probably, uh, I'm sorry, this is actually the site plan for Bill Beck, uh, just and with some uh, more visuals of what the buildings could look like. Um, and that would be the second hotel going up at that corner. And then the third hotel would be the one at Fortune Road. You see it's about a seven story building with conference facilities. And then the fourth hotel would be a custom design hotel that would be like a boutique hotel going into Neo City. Um, one of the things we've been doing is doing a stakeholder public outreach. It's, uh, we initially thought it'd be December to February. It's been more like December to October, uh, thanks to COVID. But what, as you've seen, we've reached out to all our, uh, all our stakeholders within the park as well as outside the park. We tried to reach out to as many public uh, interests that want to hear this proposal. And then I'm available for any questions and answers. Well, Kerry, thank you very much for uh, that presentation. You know, the Osceola Heritage Park is uh, quite a significant area, not just for Kissimmee, but for certainly for St. Cloud residents, all of the venues, concerts, uh, rodeo, uh, certainly the COVID testing has been a big issue. And uh, 
I, I just want us to hear because I, uh, I think in the future there'll be a lot of employment opportunities as well as possible spin-off business opportunities that hopefully the city of St. Cloud might be able to help capitalize on because of what's going on there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Do any of the council members have any questions you'd like to ask? If not, thank you, Carrie, for your time. We appreciate you coming and sharing that uh, update with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. At this time, we come to our citizens forum. Any person who desires to comment on any item not on this agenda is provided this opportunity to address the city council. Each person is requested to complete a signing form to be provided to the residing officer prior to as soon as is practical thereafter the person addresses the council. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone in the chamber or online that is requesting to speak? I don't have anyone that's uh, registered to speak on this item. Thank you very much. And that brings us to our consent agenda. The next portion of tonight's meeting is the consent agenda, which contains items that have been determined to be routine and non-controversial. If anyone in the audience wishes to address a particular item on the consent agenda, now will be the opportunity for you to do so. Additionally, as staff or members of the city council with wish to speak on a consent item, they will be given the same opportunity. Are there any items on the consent agenda that uh, council members are wanting to address or need to be pulled? Mr. Sturgeon? Yes, uh, Mayor, well, item C. We need to do some more work on that. So item C is being pulled. Anything else? And I have a comment on item D. Anything else? Then we will go to item D. Mr. Trace, you're recognized. Um, I just want to commend staff for, for working on this. This is something uh, we discussed a couple months ago of having a uh, traffic impact analysis uh, required for um, some of the developments coming in. I know everyone has to pay their impact fees, but I just want to make sure that um, any of the secondary improvements that have to happen, turn lanes, traffic lights, all of that stuff um, is paid for by the developers, um, you know, just putting in those projects. So I just want to commend staff on that. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the chamber or online wishing to speak, requesting to speak to the consent agenda? Mayor, I do not have anyone that's registered to speak on the consent agenda at this time. All right. Do we have further discussion and or motion by council? Council Member Cooper. Thank you. Uh, item, uh, item in. Bill, could you give a little bit of highlights of what, what we're going to get for $33,000? Or... I'm going to ask um, Stephanie to cover that if she's okay. on here. Not a problem. If I could, Mayor, can I recognize my Parks and Rec Director? Go right ahead. Thank you. Stephanie? No, maybe she hasn't joined us yet. I know she's on it later. Well, actually, uh, if you recall, the council directed uh, probably almost a year ago that we get new Christmas lights um, for 192 in the downtown. And that's actually on a lease. We actually lease those for that period of time. And so these are going to be all updated, nicer lights. You know, the old, other ones were kind of old looking. So I went ahead and updated those. Will we get a, at least a, a head before we can take a look at it? Or is it just going to be, oops, it's here and it got through it? Well, again, you know, I would request that, you know, you guys delegate that to me and, and my Parks and Rec people have, have picked out some nice decorations. Well, in years past, the uh, council members did it, but you have to see what the other council members about. You have anything else, Mr. Cooper? No, sir. Council I'm delegating that to, to Chuck. Um, <laughs> Stephanie is actually trying to get on. She's texting me saying she's on. So, Stephanie, can you get on? Mm -hmm. 
no, I guess she can't. She said, my hand is raised, but it won't let me speak. <laughs> okay. So we'll have her log back on for later. We need her later. All right. Councilor Matheny. Um, I was just waiting to make a motion, but with regard to the decorations, when um, a couple of years ago, I remember I got really involved in the 100th anniversary of the tree lighting and, and worked with Stephanie and her staff. And they spend a lot of time going through and looking at different um, options and making sure that it's pretty. And I, I'm fine with, with the staff still handling that. I feel like they do a great job. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's something um, we're not the tastemakers, I don't think, of the, the city. But I'm fine with continuing to let her staff handle that. They do a great job. Do we have any other input from council? I see Stephanie, uh, you're here. Would you like to speak to this item? Yeah, this is just a re renewing our contract with the Clark's uh, sales to play for all the holiday lighting. I just want to make sure this is an agreement um, for all of the decorations on 192 light poles, the decorations on Lakeshore light poles, the Christmas tree that sits in front, in front of City Hall and then all of the pole wraps in the downtown area. So Pennsylvania, New York, and then the side streets, 12th, 11th, and 10th Street. That's what this includes. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Cooper, Councilman Thank Cooper. Thank you. So I guess that uh, OUC would still put them up on the, on the poles? No, that, this, uh, this contract includes installation okay. of the decorations okay that was the question thank you any other questions if not then could i entertain a, a motion for the adoption of the consent agenda motion to approve the consent agenda um pulling item c thank you councilman Matheny. do i have a second second we have a second from council member trace madam clerk you please call the roll for the adoption of the consent agenda minus uh, item c that's been pulled council member ask you aye council member trace aye deputy mayor Matheny. aye council member cooper aye mayor blackwell aye motion carries five zero Thank you. Brings us to public hearings. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please read item number one? First reading and introduction for ordinance number 2020-26, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, amending Article 3, Division 20, Section 3.20.2, Fences, Walls, and Hedges, and Article 3, Division 20, Section 3.20.21, Flood Damage Prevention of the Land Development Code, providing for a higher standard to the city's National Flood Insurance Program community rating systems, and to adopt technical amendments to the Florida Building Code, providing for severability conflicts codification and effective date. Who do we have to speak to this item? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, this is uh, Bob Detheridge. Can you all see not yet, not your presentation, not yet. Okay, please bear with me. This is the first time I have had to do this, so. There, we have uh, a presentation, I believe, on the board now. Okay, that is not what I was looking for, but okay, so <laughs> I, I can work with this. <laughs> uh, since 1980, the city of St. Cloud has particularly participated in the uh, National Flood Insurance Program community rating system in order to mitigate flood damage in our community and to save our residents on their flood insurance premiums. Uh, the, we propose to make revisions to the land development code to 
and the uh, Florida Building Code to improve our rating with the uh, Florida rating, uh, the uh, CRS rating system. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. I'm very sorry. The city has consulted with uh, the Florida Department of Emergency Management, as well as our consultants at Wood LLC. The amendments to the uh, Land Development Code include revisions to the fencing ordinance that would allow water to flow under the fences in floodways. Also, uh, to increase the freeboard so the houses would, in a floodway, would be required to build, be built uh, 24 inches above the uh, freeboard. Can I have the next slide, please? These uh, proposed amendments are consistent with the city's strategic uh, growth for economic development, uh, growth management, and infrastructure, and public service, and it will be a uh, bonus for our citizens. Are there any questions? Are you recommending the approval of this ordinance? I certainly am. Okay. Th this this will potentially save our citizens considerably on their uh, flood insurance premiums. All right. Thank you very much. If you'll stand by. First of all, is there anyone in the audience or online that has requested to speak to this item? Madam Clerk. Mayor, we don't have anybody online or anyone that is in the audience. To speak on. All right, thank you very much. Then we'll go to the council for discussion under a motion. Council Member Matheny. Thank you. So um, thank you, um, Bob, for that update. And I know it is an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of work to submit the package for CR. So hats off to whoever is spearheading that at the city. Um, and I know that this um, this reading is time sensitive because you're trying to get it into the process to to potentially lower our um, or improve our rating um, in this next next go round. I had a couple of concerns I brought up in my agenda review, which I think could be addressed, you know, moving this forward to the next reading. But I just wanted to kind of bring up a couple of concerns that I have. So um, I love the idea of raising the finished floor elevation. I don't have any concern with that. My concern is how it gets implemented in the city, specifically in infill development. So you've got an empty lot on Dakota Avenue. And so now they're going to have this higher finished floor elevation and it becomes more of a challenge to harmonize with the homes, the older homes around it. And um, I just was requesting if they could go and look through the ordinances and things and make sure there's enough language in there about where the fill has to stop with proximity to the um, lot line to make sure um, you know they're not flooding onto other properties. I deal with this all the time at work and it's always a new home being built where there's old homes and, and all the new requirements push the house up. Um, so that was, that was one of my concerns and I guess I need two other people to agree to that to, <laughs> to get the um, staff to work on that. But the, uh, a couple other things I had, um, I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to see a fence that's built in the grid that's made out of sheet metal. I don't know if you've ever passed it. And um, when I saw that, I was very, yeah, I was very concerned um, for safety issues if, you know, when a hurricane comes through. So I did call and talk to the city manager about that. And that was a loophole in our fence ordinance. It doesn't specify material. 
So since we're touching these items with fencing, I was wanting to clean that up to like limit the material. Um, so we don't have uh, sheet metal fences going up anymore. Um, and the final issue that I had was regarding the, when you read the language, it said that if it, the fence goes over a flow way, then it has to have three inches of clearance. And I don't think three inches is probably enough everywhere. So I wanted them to maybe think about how to frame that language. You know, what if there are six inches of water on top of the ground there? Now we're putting a little dam in the way. And I know the challenge of you want the fence to keep your dog in the yard. <laughs> so, but we can't, you know, I'm more worried about flooding people, like putting putting impediments in the flowways and, and um, causing more drainage problems. So if we could maybe take a closer look at that section and um, maybe make an engineer have to comment on the, the bottom elevation of the fence or something. I don't know, I just I get concerned. And I know in my job, it's very, very difficult to go make someone move a fence and it's not politically um, pushed usually. Like once things get built, they kind of stay. Um, so just want to make sure we try to like tighten up um, where we can. And um, also, you know, I, I would need a couple people to agree with me on those points. I'll take care of that for you. Are there any objections from anyone on the council to Council Member Matheny's recommendations being considered? I hear no objections, so you have a unanimous support then. Great. And if uh -oh. when you bring, guys bring back the revised language, if you can include a red line from this first reading to the second reading. Mr. Mr. Manzaris, do I need specific names on this approval? Uh, no, Ms. Mayor, but I wanted to just talk about those two issues that, uh, at least two of the issues that Deputy Mayor Matheny brought up. We can certainly try to work on them before your next, uh, the next council meeting and get this adopted as Deputy Mayor Matheny uh, uh, mentioned. One of the big time restraints on this ordinance is to get it in place so that the rating can be redone. And there is, I believe, there's an, a, a deadline of the first week in October, as I recall. So we'll, we can try to work on those. And, if, and to the extent that uh, those changes might require additional work or a different ordinance, I'd have to I have to compare this ordinance with the language for things like the, the height of the fence and the material of the fencing. Uh, to see if it can be incorporated into this ordinance. It may require a, sub, a subsequent ordinance that we can take up after this, but we certainly can work on it. And we can report back to you on that. Well, yeah, I, I don't want to hold it up yes. for that. I'm just, if we could get them in, great, but I don't want to hold them up. Okay, so that's, we'll take that as direction. If we could work it through in this, we will. If not, we'll bring back uh, a, a subsequent ordinance so that we can get this moving forward. All right, that sounds very good. You have anything else, Councilmember Matheny? No. Are there any other uh, members from the council that would like to speak to this item? Could I entertain a motion? I move. We second. have a motion for Councilmember Cooper. We have a second from Councilmember Matheny. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Member Matheny. Aye. Councilmember Cooper? Aye. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Okay, well, Councilor David Clerk, if you'll read item number two under public hearings. First public hearing and introduction for ordinance number 2020 21. In ordinance of the City Council of City of St. Paul, Florida, assigning a zoning district of R1B, single family dwelling, compatible with low density residential future land use designation for approximately 0 0.34 acres identified of Katzenberger is located east of Missouri Avenue and south of Town Park Court, providing for entering the designation official zoning map, following the Planning Commission's recommendations, proof of publication, severability, conflict, and effective dates. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Um, may I be recognized? Yes, you may, Andre. Thank you. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is the first public hearing for a rezoning of approximately 0.34 acres. It is to rezone the property from agriculture to R1B. This property was annexed into the city several years ago, and the current zoning on the property was agriculture. As such, the properties were considered non-conforming and unable to meet the requirements for developing for single family use. The property owner is now requesting to have the property rezoned to R1B, 
which will allow for development and this property to be a conforming lots and be able to develop single family homes on the properties. <clears throat> Second, there we go. Um, as I said, it's R1B, it's low density residential on the future land use map, it's compatible with the surrounding area, and there are no adverse impacts to city facilities at this time. It's consistent with the growth management goal, and staff at its meeting during the DRC in, in May recommended approval of ordinance 2020 21. The planning commission at their meeting on August 18th, 19, 2020 also recommended approval of ordinance 2020-21 based on the 16 findings in our land development code. And we also ask that the city council um, recommend approval of ordinance 2020-21. I'm available to answer any questions. Is the applicant here wanting to speak to this? I am unsure. I do not okay. think so. Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the chamber that is requesting to speak or online? Mayor, I do have Gary Fitz, the applicant, registered online. Okay. Somebody needs to mute their microphone, sounds like, if you got commotion in the house. Did you say, is Gary here, you said? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. You can speak. I just uh, am, am availing myself if the commission has any questions. Uh, as they stated, I'm just trying to bring them into conformity with the rest of the area and hopefully improve the area and increase your tax base. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Does anyone on the council have any questions you'd like to ask? <laughs> if not, do I have a motion for the Approval and adoption of ordinance number 2020-21. So moved. We have a motion from Council Member Cooper, a second from Council Member Askew. Madam Clerk. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council Member Cooper. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Well, that's our deputy clerk, if you'll please read item number three. The public hearing. Public hearing and resolution or 2020 118R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, granting a conditional use to operate a transportation use of public utility and service structures for a bus depot at 5835 Lake Lizzie Drive and 5702 Nova Road, St. Cloud, Florida, as described in the body of this resolution. And may I be recognized? Yes, Mr. Anderson. Again, Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is a request from the School District of Osceola County for a conditional use to locate a transportation bus depot. The request falls under the provisions for utility, um, public utility and services structures. The property is approximately 131 acres and the request is to allow for this bus depot. This property is a property that the school district proposes to um, use in the future for this bus depot as well as a future high school um, in several years. <clears throat> the future land use on the property is low density residential. The zoning is agriculture. And as I said, per the land of code to locate any type of public utility services, you'll need to have a conditional use within the agricultural district. The development is compatible with the general development pattern in the area and there are no adverse impact to public facilities at this time. This request is consistent with our growth management strategic goal. And the, we held a community meeting via communication media technology or the Zoom back in July. Um, and it was done virtually and we had a few attendees, uh, no issues um, came up. The school, the school district was in attendance at that meeting. DRC and staff recommends approval of resolution 2020-118R subject to three conditions 
The first of which is that the frontage road along Nova Road shall have a higher landscape buffer. The second is that all maintenance activity related to the bus depot shall, that, that is within 300 feet of residential, shall be located completely within an enclosed building. And third is that a traffic impact analysis is required for development, site development purposes. Um, we have had since, um, well, let me go to the next slide. Um, this that also went to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission also recommended approval of Ordin Resolution 2020-118-R, and in addition, um, also uh, upheld um, staff's recommendation. Since the Planning Commission meeting, the school district was in contact with staff and provided some responses to those conditions. We have had discussions with um, the school district representative and uh, have come to a um, slight revision to the condition um, condition one, um, requiring the frontage along Nova Road, um, we will be working with the school district um, in the future on this component, being that the entire property is not being used for a transportation bus depot, only a portion. So we ask that the con while, while the conditions would apply to the entire property, the specific conditions related to the maintenance facility or the frontage along Nova Road be limited specifically to the portion that would be encompassed by the bus depot. In the future, when the remaining portion of the property is developed for another use, then we would look at um, how to apply the conditions to that remaining portion. So just to kind of recap, the conditions that are recommended are still in place. However, we are limiting the conditions specifically to the portion of the property that contains the bus depot. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I believe that the applicant is available online. Would the applicant like to speak to this item? I. May I have uh, Rhonda Blake with the school board okay. that had registered to uh, speak on that item? Rhonda, are you here? Are you unmuted? Would you like to speak to this item? Good evening, Mayor. Um, Rhonda Blake, Director of Planning Services. I am available this evening. If there are any questions um, for staff, I also have with me the Director of Transportation. Chief of Facilities and Chief of Operations and the Planning Specialist providing oversight for this project. Well, thank you very much. If you'll stand by. Is there anyone in the chamber or online that from the public that has public comment? Uh, Mayor, I do not have anyone that has uh, registered online or in the audience to speak on this item. Thank you. Then we will entertain discussion and our motion by uh, council, do any one of the council have any questions you would like to ask, Mr. Councilmember Trace? Ladies first. I see when that's open. Oh, I was going to make a motion. So. Oh, okay. Well, I have questions. Um, all right. So, with the bus facility, is this for just parking of the vehicles? It, it looks like it's for maintenance as well, because we're talking about the setback. How much? Is this like where all of the buses for the county will be maintained, or is that still happen at the transportation center on Simpson? Correct. So um, the Simpson Road facility will remain in place. Um, what will happen is, is we would relocate the current transportation facility located on Michigan Avenue in St. Cloud to this new site. Um, currently, it would hold about 80 buses with additional emergency buses on site. And then outside of five to seven years, we could see as many as 100 to 120 buses on this site. Um, what that will allow us to do by vacating the Michigan Avenue site is to relocate our maintenance complex, which is currently on 10th and Virginia, over to the Michigan Avenue site. And then we will finally be able to put the 10th and Virginia property up for sale to better meet the needs that we've been discussing with your staff for several years now. Perfect, that was part of my second question of what's the plan for the facilities on 10th Street. Um, and then will there be fueling on site on this facility as well? 
Yes, I realized I didn't answer your entire question. So it will be um, a full blown main, um, transportation depot. So Simpson Road, but scaled down to um, meet the needs of the east side of the county. So yes, there'll be fueling, there'll be fleet maintenance there, um, the bays. So just a mini version of what you currently would see if you passed um, Simpson Road. Okay, um, because, and this isn't part of kind of this application, but uh, part of my uh, trouble with some aspects of the code is if someone wanted to put a gas station, like a normal gas station, fueling station on this property, is that something that, you know, would be allowed or is that just kind of this way that it's part of the ag and it's a part of a, a school facility and it, it kind of skirts around um, some of those requirements? Because typically for some of these aspects, there are a lot of buffering and noise requirements and, and a bunch of other requirements um, if this was a full-blown fueling facility or, or industrial facility. Mr. Tracy, you asked a question to me, to staff, or yes, to sir. school? Yes, okay. So um, the, the conditional use that's on the table is for, uh, um, under the category of public utility and, and infrastructure services. And so anything that's attendant to that use would be allowed on this property based on, on that provision um, to allow for industrial use other than a public infrastructure use would not be permitted. They would have to have the correct zoning and land use. But because it's a public facility, it essentially um, um, is, I wouldn't say it exempt, but it's it's specifically permitted based on that category of use. Okay. Um, it's just something for us to, to look at in the future for some of these um, pro properties. And then do we have a timeline of the relocation of the Michigan and 10th Street um, facilities? Like, is that in the five-year capital plan? At this time, we would be looking at somewhere within um, five to seven years for this facility. And then the high school is outside of 10 years. Okay. Um, and then I did have uh, Andre send me the site plan for what's being planned. And I think this will be worked out during the TIA um, requirements and, and modeling. But if we have up to 120 buses coming in, at, in and out of here each morning and afternoon, I think some of the access requirements and um, traffic signals and some of that needs to be needs to be worked through as part of that process. Yes, we currently um, are in the process of doing um, a signal warrant and a traffic impact analysis um, for a tier three, and we expect those results in in about five weeks. Perfect. And if just entrances can line up with other things, that would be fantastic because it. Yeah, you, know, yes, you guys right have enough now on John Nova. Yes, right now the entrance to the transportation depot, our intent is to align it with the Lakes of Westerly and to have a signal um, installed there. Perfect. All right, I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Do we have Thank any you. other questions from council? Ms. Blake, do you have anything else to add? No, sir, not at this time. Thank you. And could I entertain a motion? From council. Motion to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Matheny, second from Councilmember Cooper. Madam <laughs> Cooper, you please call the roll. Councilmember Cooper. Aye. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Bla Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Brings us to item number four. That's our deputy clerk for uh, present that resolution. Public hearing for resolution number 2021-44R, a resolution of the City Council of City of St. Cloud, Florida, granting a conditional use to operate a school, private, and parochial use at 2500 Canoe Creek Road, St. Cloud, Florida, describing body this resolution. Mr. Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is a resolution to allow a um, conditional use for a parochial school within the Agriculture Zoning District, um, referred to as St. Cloud Christian Preparatory School. 
The future land use on the map is low density residential, as I said, the zoning is agriculture and per our code, um, a parochial school is allowed in this district as a conditional use. Um, the development, proposed development is consistent with the general pattern in the area and there are no adverse impacts to the existing public infrastructure at this time. It is consistent with our growth management strategic goal. It's the RFC and staff recommended approval um, of resolution 2020-144R. The planning commission at their meeting on August 18th also recommended approval of resolution 2020-144R based on the six factual matters of, of the land development code and also asked that the city council recommend approval of resolution 2020-144R. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is the applicant here wishing to speak to this item? I believe so. Mayor, I have uh, Jeremy Kibler registered for this as the applicant. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Jeremy Kibler, KDA Engineering. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. You have the floor. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, Council Members. Jeremy Kibler, KDA Engineering, 2017 13th Street, St. Cloud, Florida, 34769. I'm here tonight representing the owner and the developer of the St. Cloud Christian Preparatory School Project. And uh, I would like to first start out with that we have had the pleasure with speaking uh, to several of the neighboring property owners. Uh, and in part to those conversations, we have included uh, several exhibits. We've provided those to the clerk. Um, those include uh, architectural elevations of the proposed building facilities, as well as the proposed uh, wall along the southeast corner of the property. Uh, that being said, I would like to also uh, just touch on a few of those items of discussion. Uh, first one being sidewalks. We do propose a five-foot sidewalk along the entire uh, eastern property boundary along Canoe Creek Road. We also are proposing a 15-foot right-of-way dedication for Canoe Creek Road for the future expansion and improvement of Canoe Creek Road. Uh, if the county, uh, which it Canoe Creek Road is, of course, in the jurisdiction of the county's control for uh, design and access. If they do require more, we're happy to, to dedicate more, but that is consistent uh, with the neighboring properties in the area. Uh, as far as fencing, do want to note that uh, in accordance with the educational facilities uh, and protection, not only for the students at the school, but also for the existing residents, uh, the proposed wet detention pond will be fully fenced. Um, we, again, just noting that we have provided uh, an elevation, which essentially is a photograph of the wall that would be at the southeast corner. Again, that's essentially your precast panel uh, type of wall, uh, which is very typical and similar to what you see a DOT doing on the turnpike, just at a much smaller scale. Uh, additionally, would also like to touch on the buffers. Um, we've provided a 25 foot medium buffer essentially around the entire project, except for the only area where we can't, which is the southeast corner. And that's where the wall uh, would be located. And the intent there uh, is really to preserve uh, as much of the existing vegetation as possible. That this is what we've heard from the residents uh, that is desirable to them. Uh, we will work with them and remove uh, exotic and non-native species, invasive species, uh, and replace those with native uh, species in accordance with the St. Cloud LDC. And uh, I believe that covers most of, of all the topics. We're here to answer any specific questions the council members may have, and we ask uh, for your recommendation uh, of approval, uh, as the Planning Commission has also done so as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kibler. If you'll please stand by. Madam Clerk, is there anybody in the chamber or online to speak to this item? I did have a Robert Assembler or Simple uh, register online. I don't know if they had registered to view the meeting, but they did leave a statement. Okay, would you please share the statement? He states uh, school at 2500 Canoe Creek Road. My property backs up to the proposed site. There is a low-lying area with a small cypress swamp. 
When it rains, this water drains onto parts of my property, causing some flooding. I am requesting that the water runoff from the school be diverted away from my property as more water may flood my entire property. His address is 3251 Bailey Road. Thank you. Mr. Kipper, would you like to speak to this concern? Uh, certainly. Can you hear me still? Yes, we can. Uh, good evening, Jeremy Kibler, KDA Engineering. Again, we are aware of, a, of an off-site conservation area, which would be the northwest corner of the property. Again, we do intend on preserving as much as we can in that particular corner. Um, as, as the council knows, in many cases with developments uh, like such as being, as being proposed, um, if there are any existing underlying conditions uh, that are noted that may be deficient, it's an opportunity to correct those uh, and to work with city staff and engineering staff. Of course, uh, any of the stormwater management facilities will not only need to be approved by the city of St. Cloud, but also the South Florida Water Management District in this particular case. Thank you. Would anyone on the council like to speak to this item or ask any questions? I, oh, sorry, Council Member Thiem, they changed the screen on me. <laughs> Council Member Thiem. Thank you. Um, so my personal feeling is nothing messes up traffic more than sticking a school on a, on a major roadway like like what they're proposing. Have you done a traffic um, analysis in this area? I mean, we all see it. You drive to, you, you know, when I used to drive to work and school's out, I mean, I zip to work. And then when school's in, it's, you just get backed up at every school that you pass. And I just, it, you know, nothing messes up the traffic more. Sure, sure. Uh, Jeremy Kibler, KDA Engineering again. I would like to note that uh, the capacity for this proposed school uh, is a maximum of 270 students. Uh, we've done a limited traffic analysis, which basically in includes a chip generation. If we use the IT 10th generation, uh, and we look at PM peak hour trips generated by the proposed project, which is essentially uh, the, the methodology utilized for levels of service um, on Canoe Creek Road, we have uh, 26 PM peak hour trips, which is the max leaving the site and that actually is 3.7% uh, of the background PM peak hour volume, which ends up being a de minimis impact. Um, I can also note that based on uh, current trip generation analysis, the Canoe Creek Road is a level of service C uh, and is also included in the five-year CIP. We do believe that um, the existing striping uh, on Canoe Creek Road uh, actually lends itself quite well to what we would call an offset uh, intersection with the adjacent uh, project on the opposite side of the road. Um, it does meet, uh, based on our analysis, does meet County LDC, which is the, you know, the entity, the jurisdiction that would review and approve uh, the proposed access. Um, we feel that it can be safely and efficiently achieved. Jeremy, did you say 270 students, but you're PM peak is 26 trips. Did you, is that what you said? Or did I mishear that? Correct. It, it, that is correct. Keep in mind, we do, it is K, K through 12. So that, that also factors into the overall calculation as well. Uh, Mr. Kibler, would you have the AM peak hour trip generation? Because I think on schools, because they let out before that five to 7 PM range, the AM might, the AM incoming might hit that a little bit higher of a trip generation. Sure, sure. the AM the AM uh, peak hour is of course higher than the PM peak hour, but as we know, uh, the oh, the volume of Canoe Creek Road in this particular case is governed by the PM peak hour. I don't have the uh, the a, the AM peak hour for Canoe Creek Road in front of me uh, right now, um, but it is uh, much less than the PM peak hour volume. But do you know what that generation would be from the site? I do not have that in front of me right now. What I can say is, um, of course, you know, in this particular circumstance, um, the, the county will require uh, a traffic impact analysis prior to any uh, permitting efforts. Um, so uh, we can also 
agree to provide any results to the city at the same time. Um, but I do not have that, that calculation in front of me right now. And I'm uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Ruthini was still. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. That's just, you know, I just don't like to see schools cited on these major roads. I just know what, what it does to the traffic. Um, and and I agree with council member Trace. It's the it's the morning that's going to mess you up because obviously the PM. Um, there's not people leaving the school. And then on a a lot of those studies were based on, you know, 80 percent of the kids getting bust like a normal public school on something like this. It's probably 100 percent of the kids are getting picked up and dropped off by four wheeled vehicle, correct? Uh, I wouldn't say quite 100 percent. You have uh, many, uh, you know, th these particular uh, folks, the developer has many of these uh, schools throughout the county in, in operation. And it really comes down to an operational plan, um, which I was going to go ahead and add. Uh, if we have an operational plan for interior traffic circulation. You have the stacking and queue that's included both in the right turn lanes and the left turn lanes that, that are offside as well. Um, so really what it is, the staggered uh, drop off and pick up and, and that's controlled uh, through the facility. Um, we can, you know, of course, agree to monitor that uh, throughout uh, the course of the project. I mean, that's gonna be done already, but we can we can uh, commit to reporting to the city and providing any, uh, you know, analysis on an annual basis, uh, if that was something that the council would like to see. But we do feel that there is adequate uh, storage and circulation uh, to achieve uh, safely, the 270 student max that's being proposed here. And and how many? Um, because I guess you're just going to serpentine through the site, I you know, and there's parking spots as well. How many spaces or cars do you fit in the serpentine fashion? Based on the interior uh, traffic circulation, uh, you're you're approaching 80 vehicles or so, and you would also have additional vehicles that could queue. Uh, which I know this, this school district has done in the past uh, in the in the turn lanes if that was necessary. Um, of course, it's not a not a first option, but um, and we're happy to provide an exhibit if we need to to do that at the next stage with the site development plan uh, to show that uh, stacking and the, and the number of vehicles that would be allowed there. But essentially, you would enter it into the project, uh, make your immediate right, and then circulate around the the property so that you'd have. Uh, a pickup and drop off area adjacent to the educational building facility on the what would be the east side. And then, um, you know, what I've seen for other schools that have some of these charter schools that have pickup and drop off, I saw one that has four lanes and four cars deep all on a covered area that pick up and drop off at the same time. So 16 kids can load and unload at the same time. Um, and all cross safely, is that uh, is that how you guys are setting this up? I, the, the layout wasn't sent to us as part of the uh, backup, so. Sure, sure. Uh, as part of the operational plan, the intent is the, it would be two lanes, not four, but it'd be two lanes uh, that would uh, traverse uh, cohesively to the south and adjacent to the pickup area, um, which would be the east side of the educational building facility. Um, and. Again, like you, like you stated, safely allow kids to, to be picked up and then go ahead and leave the facility. All right. Um, and then I did not see as part of the recommendation, there was a, a commitment made in some of this backup about um, that wall. I did not see that as part of the staff recommendation. Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may. Um, Andre Anderson, community development director. Um, Mr. Tracy, you're correct. Um, this is a entitlement approval for a conditional use. It's a zoning. And as such, any site plan proposal is not part of this approval. Um, the site planning would come at a later date. However, if the council wishes to impose anything that Mr. Kibler has spoken about as part of your conditions of approval for the conditional use, you're welcome to do that. He can proffer it and you can accept it or you can require it and the applicant can then decide to accept or not to accept it. 
Um, at this point, we have not reviewed the site plan. We have not looked at any traffic studies because this is not the stage at which staff would, would look at those items. Okay, because this item looks very similar to the last one that was up here and there was um, comments and commitments made that were part of that record as well. So I just I figured it, that it was the correct. same way. That is correct. Okay. Um, we did not make any recommendations of any additional conditions. However, the council is welcome to impose conditions. Okay, I just I just want to point out I have serious concerns about the the stacking and the pick up and drop off of, you know, if this goes to a different operator and they don't have the same operational plan or operational efficiency for that pick up and drop off, and it just snarls that whole area and it's only a two lane road, so mm -hmm. it's not. I don't know. So I'll let someone else go. Councilmember Matheny, you're all. Yeah, I, I was just going to add more um, salt to the wound, but um, you know, it's it's great that the school is promising an operational plan, but in my job, we deal with the school complaints all the time, charter schools and regular schools, and the parents just do some crazy stuff. You know, they don't want to get in the queue to go through and spend a half hour to drop their kid off. So they just stop right on the middle of Narcusi road and let their kids out, you know, or they pull into the subdivision and let their kids out and the kids have to walk, you know, there's just all this turmoil that happens because parents don't want to go into the queue and wait a half hour to weave in and out and come back out. I just, you know, the schools on these major roads, I just um, have major concerns. It if I may, I, I don't know if I can address that, Jeremy Kibler again. Go ahead and speak. Um, we'd be happy to, if, if the council uh, would be willing to consider, be happy to, and I, again, I'd fall back on Mr. Manzaris. Um, if, if there were operational concerns or issues uh, that became uh, transparent uh, down the road, that the conditional use could be revoked at any point in time if, if the issue wasn't corrected. Uh, we certainly certainly feel that we can achieve uh, what we're, what's being proposed here tonight uh, in a safe and efficient way. And if we can't um, and it becomes an issue, we're certainly uh, happy to, to state that it could be revoked if that's a possibility, I don't know. Mr. Manzaris, do you have any input for us? Well, that certainly is something that you could put in a conditional use permit. Uh, the We would have to try to draft some language, and I'm not sure we can get that done tonight, that would address that. Uh, uh, essentially, there could be a, some triggering language in that if the either tied to stacking or tied to overall traffic issues, uh, that the matter could be brought back for the to the city council for consideration or revocation of the conditional use permit uh, i will tell you though that that can be problematic because a future city council is going to have to sit there with a school that is operating with 200 and something or so families whose kids are going to that school and it's going to put that that council that has to make that decision in a very difficult position i understand we have any other discussion or motion and or motion by council but mr mayor may i make another comment yes you may mr. Uh, good evening jeremy kibler again i appreciate appreciate it mr mayor thank you for your time um i would just like to add again just to just to repeat that of course the you know the access the circulation the stacking uh the off-site design of the turn lanes and storage lanes that all has to be uh reviewed and approved by osceola county even if we were to get the conditional use approved here tonight by council, um, there, there's certainly a, a possibility that the county would not uh, grant an access permit and the offsite design necessary to support the project, and it would it would stop basically at that point in time anyway. So I would just like the the council to consider that as well. Thank you, Councilman Nasku. Yeah, I, I'm um, I'm having a hard time with this one. When you put a big school like that, and 250 kids doesn't seem like a lot, but it is when you already have a road that's a C rating. Um, I'd like to see some kind of traffic study that literally shows that this is this could work because once it's built, there's no way of stopping it at that point. Um, so I know Jeremy do nice work. I just uh, this one is this is tough uh, just because I'm afraid 
we start building this thing, our citizens are going to blow a head gasket and find out we're going to put more uh, demand on Canoe Creek Road, which is about problematic as it is right now. Mr. Mayor, may I address? Yes, you may. Um, I would uh, I would respectfully ask uh, the council if that is something they would like to see that uh, we go ahead and continue this particular item, uh, perhaps um, uh, maybe two council meetings down the road to give us ample time to prepare a study that um, that the council can review as part of this approval and maybe and maybe gain a better comfort level at that point in time. Mr. Mr. Rizaris. Uh, well, actually, before Mr. Keeler made that request, that's what I was going to suggest because the council obviously needs additional information. And I was going to ask him if he, based on that, whether he wanted to ask for a continuance. So I think it would be appropriate for you to consider at this point uh, because he's asked for it to provide some additional information and um, continue it for the 30 days. Thank you. Councilmember Trice. Um, and if as part of that, if I could just um, ask uh, for staff to review that site plan as well and have some site specific comments because I and I don't know if that's just not a requirement of the conditional use and we probably just should just fix that to where it, these conditional uses are very site specific and there are their needs and requirements of things that happen around it um, or because of it. So I think that should just be part of the process. Mr. Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. Uh, Mr. Trace, um, the reason why this is not being reviewed at this point is because what you have or what the applicant has submitted is a conceptual site plan and not a actual site plan that meets our site development standards for review by our development review committee. So if the council wishes for staff to review a site development plan as part of a conditional use permit then we will need for the applicant to submit a formal application that would include an application for drc and all the requisite forms fees and then we would review it as part of the conditional use otherwise we are reviewing a con concept plan that is not actually engineered councilmember trace um if, if the applicant wants to make that application i just don't think that's a, a 30 day process to get that through and then to a public hearing so um it just it just seems like a, a interesting way to try to make a decision on this without all of that information um reviewed and uh, approved by staff mr menzares do you have anything else for us uh no sir other than to make the general comment that uh, the applicant obviously it behooves the applicant to provide more information to make the council make the best determination it can. Uh, I think Mr. Trace's comments were uh, are, are appropriate and he's, he's kind of telegraphing a little bit about what he'd like to see if he's going to consider this item favorably. And I think uh, that's some good information for the applicant to have. With that being said, if the council wishes to continue it for, uh, for 30 days as requested by the applicant, you certainly can do that. That will be a continuation to the October 22nd meeting. I'm sorry, October, October, that would be October 8th. October 8th, I'm sorry. Mr. Mayor, may I also be recognized again? Yes, you may, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. So um, if the applicant is considering the continuance of this item and the possible submission of a site of one plan, 30 days will be insufficient time for the DRC to review, convene, and make a decision on the site of one plan. So much time would you need? Again, it's really up to the applicant because typically when we review it, our DRC gets scheduled anywhere right. from 30 to 45 days and then if there are revisions the applicant then has to make those revisions so it's really a, it could be as much as 60 days before we even have a final decision on an application just because of the length of time it may take for the applicant to make revisions that staff may request in addition to the fact that the county would also be involved in that review process 
Mr. Mayor, uh, Jeremy Kibler, if I may. Yes, you may. Mr. Kibler. Um, I, it seems that we're what we're talking about is a site development plan application, which is essentially full blown construction plan documents. Um, what I would suggest if if council and if staff was amenable to it would be to have the, the tra traffic impact analysis prepared and submitted and then perhaps perform a maybe a minor site plan application that is reviewed by uh, engineering and planning staff and perhaps not a full, you know, a full site development plan, which is construction plan documents. I mean, really what we're talking about is uh, a request for the use, which is, this is more of a zoning type of approval. And I think the, the minor site plan would give enough, uh, would give enough review level as far as engineering and planning to give some feedback and comment as to applicability and, uh, meeting the you know standard requirements of the LDC. I don't know if maybe Mr. Anderson can comment on that. Anderson. Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may. Thank you. So I am not an engineer, and so I cannot comment on the engineering that we require for this site. Um, I would um, only speculate that the site conditions may alter or cause the design of the project to be adjusted for whatever reason, whether it's, whether it's you know, topographic or whatever. And again, I'm not an engineer, so I can't really comment on that. I do not think it's just a zoning exercise. It is also an engineering exercise that the city engineer and others in the public utilities and public services would need to weigh in on. So my recommendation um, would be that if we are going to review anything, it would be a full site development plan. Mr. Kibler, do you want to respond to that? Sure. sure. <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, Jeremy Kibler, KDA Engineering, I'm not sure if, if Mr. Anderson maybe misunderstood me. My, my understanding is the minor site plan application is reviewed by uh, engineering and planning and utilities as well. But we're, we're more than happy to, if, if that's what council would like to see and that's what staff would like to see, we would need the additional time though. Um, so I think a 60 day continuance is more in line um, with being able to achieve or you know come close to achieving that. Um, if the minor site plan was a consideration, we'd also like to look at that. My understanding is that application, uh, it is a formal application and reviewed by engineering, planning and utilities as well. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Matheny had her line up first. I'll get to you next, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of chime in in support of um, not going down this path of these detailed construction plans. I know how much um, work and effort and time that that takes, and then we don't approve the conditional use. Um, you know, I, I maybe like a I, Mr. Anderson can help with it. Maybe like the site plan light kind of version. I don't. I mean, I'm more concerned about the traffic and the layout and things like that. I'm. It's going to be a hard sell for me um, on this road. So I certainly don't want to direct him to go and do hundreds of hours of work to come up with final, you know, engineering drawings and then have the conditional use not pass. I don't, you know, just my two cents. All right, Councilmember Cooper. Thank you. I missed the the how many students are going to be coming there now. I missed that. It's Jeremy Kibler. It's a, a maximum of 270 students and it'd be K through 12. All right. Thank you. So seems like we're kind of stuck. Do we have a motion for a continuance for 60 days? Based on, the, Do, go ahead. We have that date certain. Uh, that's just what I'm asking. Bringing it up for discussion. Yeah, I, I'm fine with. I'm fine with 60 days um, to allow them to do. I, I agree with uh, Deputy Mayor Matheny about the some sort of site plan that's reviewed by um, planning and engineering staff. Um, and then, do we have a date of approximately 60 days out uh, council meeting? Is um, Madam Clark the November first? The only meeting in November is November twelfth. Is that correct? Correct. 
So there, yeah, sixty days would be about November would be the November twelfth meeting. Uh, so I'd like um, to make a motion to continue uh, the resolution twenty twenty one forty four R until the November twelfth meeting to allow staff and the applicant to work together on a preliminary site plan review, um, uh, going through traffic um, uh, considerations. A second. Okay. We have a second from Council Member Askew. Is that correct? That's correct. The motion is for continuance to November the 12th on the conditions that have been stated here. So, Mayor, may I be recognized just to, for clarification purposes, please? Yes, you may. Um, could I just understand that this is to continue to the November 12th City Council meeting to allow staff to work with the applicant to review what a minor site plan or a full site plan minor site plan mm -hmm. just two-dimensional type i think they've got enough storm water and that figured out um just two-dimensional um with uh, traffic analysis as well um again just for clarification our code allows for uh, full site plan minor site plan and mini site plan and this doesn't qualify as a mini but a minor if you want to go that route so so to clarify that in the record. Minor it is. Thank you. So moved. And we still have a second from Council Member Askew, correct? That's correct, second. Everyone understand what the motion is? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. You need, you're on need to unmute yourself. You talk, I did, I. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your eye. Councilmember Cooper. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carry five zero. Mr. Kipper, you have some work to do. A lot of work, it's like. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. It brings us to council action. Item number one, deputy clerk, will you please read? Resolution number 2020-209R, a resolution of the city council of the city of St. Paul, Florida, adopting a fiscal year 2020 annual action plan for the community development block grant program, providing for context and providing for an effective date. And who do we have speaking to this item? The mayor may I be recognized. Yes, you may, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. Uh, this is the adoption of the um, Community Development Block Grant 2020 Annual Action Plan. As you may recall, we adopted the five-year consolidated plan, and um, this was for the 2019 to 2023 plan. And then we have already adopted the 2019 annual action plan, which allowed us to have the drawdown of the requisite funds from HUD. Um, as you know, this um, plan is to address um, low to moderate income persons that are 80% of the area median income for individuals, households, and for neighborhoods. And some of the eligible uses for this funding is for public improvement facilities, residential rehab, public service, economic development, and so on. The estimated funding for the 2020 annual action plan is $338,107. Um, this screen that you're looking at shows the allocation of the funds that we received to date and that we would receive for the 2020 allocation. So in 2019, we were allocated $319,076. In 2020, we'd be allocated $330,107 for a total of $657,183. The breakdown of the um, program funding for the annual action plan includes um, several things. Overall coordination, which is 20% of the, of the funding for the 2020 year. Um, we are looking at housing strategy one, which is for home ownership. Also another housing strategy is for housing construction. And then the final one is for housing rehabilitation, again, under the housing strategy for a total of $338,107. These allocation provisions, um, because of COVID, extends the deadline for, for plan submissions. And so the fiscal year 19, which was last year, and the fiscal year 2020 consolidated plan and action plan 
are actually due August 16th, 2020. However, we are proceeding to propose to adopt the fiscal year 20 plan now so that we can get the allocation rather than later. Um, it also suspends a 50% cap on public services um, fund allocation. Um, it also waived the five day public comment period. We had posted this for public comment since August 20th. Um, and also suspends any in-person in public hearings that must be conducted. This meeting is a public hearing for the purpose of HUD requirements. And in addition, the COVID-19 also um, waived additional um, program requirements that may or may not apply to this annual action plan. Next steps in the process is, is of course, as I said, the public coming period, which began August 20th and continues through tonight. Um, and again, this is a public hearing requirement for HUD that we're conducting tonight. Um, the HUD submission date would be right after this item is adopted. We would prepare it and submit it to HUD and then would allow us to begin any drawdown of those funds for community development um, programs. This action plan is consistent with our economic development goals and also with the growth management strategic goals. Staff recommends approval of resolution 2020-2009R and asks that the city council also approve resolution 2020-2009R. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. My consultant, uh, I think, is online and I'll be able to answer any questions should you have them. Would the consultant like to speak to this item? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. This is Eric Chatham with Civitas. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or provide support should uh, Andre not be able to answer those questions, but I uh, have no further comment. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Madam, Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the chamber or online to speak to this item? Mayor, I don't have anyone in registered and no one in line here in Thank the audience. You. Thank you. This time we'll entertain discussion or motion by council. Do we have any questions? Could I entertain a motion for the adoption of resolution number 2020-209-R? Motion to approve. We have a motion from Council Member Trace, a second from Council Member Askew. Yeah. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council Member Cooper. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chatham. Thank, Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Brings us to item number two. Madam Clerk. Resolution number 2020-238-R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, authorizing the grant application of the Florida Communities Trust, FCT, Parks and Open Spaces, Forever, Florida Forever Program for the purchase of 219.27 plus minus acres of certain real locate certain real location located on Jones Road in St. Cloud, Florida, known as Hastings Ranch, authorizing the city manager or his designee to submit the grant application. Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, Mr. Sturgeon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I place this on the agenda one because we're required under our grant to uh, policy to request permission to put in for a grant. But I also want to let the council know we're coming towards the end of the due diligence period with Mr. Hastings. I believe it's October 8th. And um, I placed it on the agenda tonight because I'm going to need some direction so we don't run up to the last meeting of the month. So tonight I'd like to talk about the grant. I'm going to have Stephanie Holtkamp talk about the grant. Then I'm going to have Ms. Colazzo talk about operational costs and some of the required improvements we're going to have to make if we purchase the property. And then back to um, also Ms. Colazzo to go over a funding strategy to purchase the property. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Holtkamp to talk about the grant. Yep. Good evening, Council. Stephanie Holtkamp, Parks and Recreation Director. So we're, we're asking, uh, this resolution is asking uh, authorization to apply for the Florida Communities Trust Grant. Um, we're asking, there was a scrivener's error, so actually um, we're asking the grant 
it would be 60% of the 5.75 million, which is 3,450,000. Plus we're able to ask for an additional $25,000 for closing costs and additional uh, fees related to closing on the property. The city would then be responsible 40% of the 5.75 million, which is 2,300,000. Um, this is a 60-40 match uh, for this grant. There is a possibility, or there, there, there is another option to go is a 75-25, um, but considering um, the points that are needed to, to be awarded the grant, our grant writer um, strongly suggests that we stay with a 60-40 split for this grant to, to get it awarded. And if you had any additional questions about the grant, I'd be happy to answer those. Are there any questions from council, council member Trace? <laughs> if you could go over those numbers again, I did not have my pen ready when you said um, what sure. the application amount was in the 6040. Mm -hmm. So the appraisal that was used to come up with the uh, percentage split was the 5.75 appraisal. So the 60% of the 5.75 was 3,450,000 we'd be asking. Then we're also able to ask for an additional $25,000 for um, closing costs and any other fees incurred uh, to close on the property. So the total grant ask would be 3,475,000. The city's match at 40% of the 5.75 million is 2,300,000. Anything else, Mr. Trace? Thank you. And if I could recognize Ms. Colazzo Mayor to talk about the due diligence we did as far as improvements that we will need to make to the property and operational cost. Ms. Colazzo, you have floor. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> you're still not, you're still muted. You're still muted. There you go. I can hear you now. Perfect. So sorry for that. Uh, good, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Honorable Council. As requested by the city manager, um, I will present a layout of uh, one, the revenue analysis that has been done, as well as expenditure breakouts and uh, the cost analysis in the purchase of Hastings Ranch. Just to lay down some background, uh, back a couple months ago, you were presented, as mentioned before, the FCT grant, which has been mentioned, which is the Florida Communities Trust with a timeline um, excuse me, it's the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant, LWCF, with applications starting January 31st all the way through October 20th for contracts received. Um, with that being said, the appraised price of $5.75 million. Um, revenue was reviewed with all day bookings and block time bookings at various rates, at residence rates and non-residence rates with a projected potential revenue of $225,250 a year. That is with the expectation that this uh, park would be rented 52 weeks of the year completely um, at the various rates. This is an average amount of what was originally projected. With that being said, those numbers equate to an $18,000 a month revenue potential at the 52 week mark with the various rates um, presented. Operating costs, startup costs to include reoccurring costs is at $1.1 million, almost $1.2 million. Inclusive in this is things such as uh, fire sprinkler inspections and monitoring, uh, police department, trailers, landscaping, fencing, Parks and Recreation, standard reoccurring costs like utilities, repairs and maintenance, trail material, public works, um, things like dirt road grading, pond spraying, um, enclosures, and then of course building maintenance coming in with custodial services, cleaning supplies, et cetera. And then finally information technology infrastructure in the sense of uh, network switches and ports and routers, Wi-Fi, battery supply backups. 
the um, annual uh, cost <clears throat> for Hastings Ranch to be maintained at this time with these estimates uh, is a 18,866 monthly cost. Again, remember that that revenue projection is as if all cylinders are on. Funding strategies for uh, Hastings Ranch, 5.75 million currently impact fee park impact fee projected fund balance brought forward is four million one hundred and forty two thousand three hundred and eighty eight dollars also inclusive in the funding strategy is a potential of a minimum of one million six hundred thousand dollars in park impact fees that are owed from osceola county The grant application, of course, is not guaranteed at this time, uh, therefore has not been equated into this. And then a bonding strategy was not uh, put into the strategy as currently with the COVID uh, impacts, uh, it would be fiscally uh, kind of not impossible, but very hard to present revenues as a form of contingency for the bonding with the impact fees of park where they are uh, to include another $950,000 coming in from police uh, impact fees owed to Parks and Rec. There is sufficient dollars there to take care of this purchase with um, the money we have um, projected to be uh, rolled over in, uh, after the year is done. This is uh, still before projections of auditor adjustments at the end of the year. Any prepaid and inventory at this time, we should not affect the impact fees. That is the overview at this time for funding strategies, the revenue outlook, and expenditure projections to include capital outlay for the purchase of Hastings Rent. Mayor, can I be recognized? Yes, you may, Mr. Stringer. So, again, this has been a uh, something that staff has wanted, and I've struggled with this on what recommendation to make, and I can tell you this. The city needs green space. If we purchase this property, we are taking a pretty good risk during COVID-19 um, of these operational costs and the upgrades. With that said, um, I spoke to Mr. Hastings and Mr. Manceras, and he would be interested in doing a lease purchase agreement, um, give him a significant amount of money down and pay it over a three-year period. Um, as you know, um, we do have the impact fees right now to be able to give them a significant down payment and make these payments over three to five years. Uh, like I said, we will be taking a risk because we don't know what the market drivers are going to be uh, moving forward as far as renting the facility. But the good side of it is we'll have green space. Um, I don't know. I'm not in Mr. Hastings head. I know he has had other offers and I personally don't want to see a bunch of houses built in there. I'd like to see us preserve this green space. That's my opinion. Thank you. Do we have any other questions by council at this point? Councilmember Matheny. Thank you. Um, Wendy, I didn't, Ms. Colazzo, did, I was writing, I, I wrote a whole bunch of things while you were talking. <laughs> so maybe I missed it. But I think we also had a $400,000 grant that I didn't hear mentioned. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I did not mention it because that $400,000 grant will not be awarded to the city. The environmental report that was submitted was not accepted by the grantor. Therefore, we are out of the running for the $400,000 award. Uh, okay. However, however, if I could jump in for a second, Mayor. We've contacted our lobbyists and we're going to circle back around. We have not received a total denial yet. We've contacted our federal lobbyist for the National Park Service. Um, to reach out to them and see if we can resurrect that grant. And we just learned that since briefings. That was, uh, <laughs> that's, that's great news to keep to keep on top of that. So um, I'll give my two cents. I know that probably more people want to say, but this has been something that um, I've been supporting since day one. Uh, I agree with the city manager that, you know, there's no more land being built. You know, it's not being created anywhere. This is a great opportunity for us to get a meaningful chunk of green space, open space, it's beautiful property. Um, I, you know, we, ha <laughs> we have park impact fees 
that's what we're supposed to use them for. I mean, there's not other things we can't, we can't do other things with this money. This is what this money is for. Um, I guess I'm not quite a hundred percent following. I know when I had my briefing and we talked about the grant application, um, but I don't believe they're awarding for like till April or so of 2021. And then his due diligence is coming to an end. So are you wanting direction to, I guess, for us to put um, a down payment? I'm not sure kind of what direction. I'm still in full support of us acquiring this property. Um, I, I just think we'll, we'll be kicking ourselves if we don't. And I'm also agree with the city manager. I don't wanna see a bunch of houses go in um, and take this beautiful piece of property. Council Member Cooper. Thank you. Um, just a quick question or two. It seems like that, okay, if you're going to get this, these uh, grants and you're going to get uh, 1.3 million or whatever it is to the county, from the county, we're still going to be short. How much money are we going to be short of the 5.7? Yes. Well, we're, uh, I'm sorry, can I be recognized, Mayor? Uh, yes, Ms. Plaza. Okay, Wendy Colazzo, Finance Director. Um, Mr. Cooper, uh, we, we wouldn't really be sure. The funding strategy list for 5.75. At this point, we're expecting to have $4.1 million in rollover from impact fees. So my strategy would be that we could put the down payment for $3.5 million uh, to Mr. Hastings and then lease out the remaining $2.2 million over three years. That's 62500 a month that we would pay uh, amortized to that. And then we are still, that does not include the one point at a minimum $6 million that we have inbound from the county. So we have more than enough at this point to cover it with that strategy. Yeah, but you take without, that money. You, without grant money. If you take all that money out of out of the fund right there, the city fund, how much how much depleted is it going to be? How much can be left in that? Well, sir, uh, four point one million dollars minus three and a half, sir. I still leave six hundred thousand in impact fee in park impact fee, and that's just the balance that I will leave. We still are getting revenue through the year from all our planning and zoning and building permits that's coming into that fund. So that's what I would leave, almost 600000 We could change a little bit of that, you know, and we still have some negotiating deals that we can do. We have, we could do a $3 million versus a $3 million five, but we have enough to cover. We won't deplete the fund, and we're still going to receive revenue for fiscal year 21. So we can more than a, a afford that, you know what I mean? So, and that doesn't include the million six and or the potential award of the grant that would then pay us back for what we spent out, you know, so we're, we're, pretty well there but if you don't get the grants then you're going to be stuck a whole lot more of the money that we don't have so ah, you're going to have well, to you're going to get into fun you're going to have to go and borrow the money well so no. your finance director if you listen to the strategy i've planned it out without including the grant so we are nice and fine if we don't get it because i don't count any eggs i don't have in my basket so we're covered i can cover it without the grant the grant okay. is just icing on the cake sir well at least in the beginning when this thing started, I was I was all support because this is going to be OUC. They were going to handle all this thing. And we were going to have any big money to put out. Now it's now it's turned around and now it's in, in front of our, our plate. And it seems like, I guess the question is, we've got Chisholm Park out there and it's close to, what, 100 acres right there? That's green space. We're not even using it. What the heck are we doing? You want to go buy another one that's only five miles away? That doesn't make that doesn't compute to me. This is on Jones Road. This is in the county, and you're talking about bringing it into the city. It, it just, to me, it boggles the mind right now compared to what it did three months ago. I mean, everything changed upside down. To, to me, it did. So. I, we've got to be good stewards of spending the money from the citizens. And I understand this money is in the, in the bank right now from St. Cloud. But that, that doesn't mean that you can just go and buy another 100 acres because you just like to it. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's five miles away from where we're at now. We've already got a right there at Chisholm Park. I cannot see that. I'm sorry. That's it. 
Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Councilmember Trace. I see Mr. Manzaris has his microphone on too. I'll get to him next. You have something to say, Mr. Trace? Okay. Um, so my feelings about it um, really haven't changed from uh, before. To me, this is a nice to have, um, not a need to have. It's a beautiful piece of property. Um, I would just wish it was dedicated to us for free instead of um, having to spend um, all the money on it. So if I'm I'm trying to read my chicken scratch, we're purchasing the property for $5.75 million, about $1.2 million in startup costs to get it um, code compliant. So that's $7 million for a venture that's going to break even. And I'm, I'm glad that the numbers at least break even on the revenue and maintenance cost, um, which, which is, you know, what, what parks should do. I mean, they shouldn't, it shouldn't be a huge profit center. It's a great asset. I think we have the best parks department in central Florida. Um, and I think they could run this as a first class facility. It's just the, the upfront cost of $7 million. Um, you know, the only way I'd support this is if we had the guarantee on that grant. Um, but that's only covering three and a half million out of $7 million. Um, so this is, this is a tough putt for me. Mr. Manzaris. Well, I was, I was going to answer a Deputy Mayor Matheny's question about what, or what we were looking at for tonight to make sure everybody understood. So the only action I'm before you tonight that we're asking for is to decide to proceed with the grant application. That's the resolution that's in front of you. As Mr. Sturgeon pointed out, uh, we need to let the prospective buyer, the, I mean, the seller, the Hastings family know by October 8th, I believe it is, uh, that whether we want to continue with the contract, that's when our due diligence period expires. So uh, the idea was to bring it before you so that we could get some information, decide how this council wanted to proceed. Uh, the idea that Mr. Sturgeon has uh, has um, uh, discussed regarding a lease of the property and a payment of, of significant money down for, uh, 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 as a down payment would require amendment to the contract the current contract. So the plan would be is if the council wants to move forward tonight, we would get with, with uh, Mr. Hastings and his and his attorney, revise the agreement the way it is and bring it back to you at the next council meeting for final approval. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from council at this point? Mayor. Council Member Cooper. Thank you. I'll go back around the circle again the second time. We've got a hundred acres out there at Chisholm Park. I'm still back hitting it again. We're five miles away from there to Jones Road. I just can't see why you want to go back and buy something else. I, I understood what we did three months, four months ago when OUC was going to pay for it. I didn't have a problem. Now that we're going to go and spend that kind of money and COVID-19 could come back in as bad or worse than it was, the citizens are going to be stuck with that. If the four of you want to live with that, that's one thing, but I can't. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Trace. I um, just kind of want to bring up a, a couple other points. Um, I uh, echo uh, Mr. Cooper's comments about um, just kind of the deal changing and, and COVID changing things. Um, I do think we do need passive recreation um, areas. Uh, to me, I don't think we, it would be prudent for us to move forward with the contract until we get awarded this grant, if we get awarded this grant. So I'm, I'm fine moving forward with the application. I mean, we do grant applications now, it seems like almost every meeting, um, and we've had pretty good success. I think we have great grant writers. Um, so I'm, I'm f fine moving forward with the grant, but with the understanding that we would only move forward with the property purchase if we get awarded the grant. And then I kind of want to throw something else out there of, you know, the, the, the pavilion and everything's nice, the stuff that's there, but we're having to spend $1.2 million to bring it up to snuff. Would it be possible for us to just possibly purchase the Western portion of the property, part of what is the parking lot now, and then that whole borrow pit um, area, um, you know, for, for a lot further reduced price, but that's kind of seems like a bite we can take off of have some sort of trail around that borrow pit and then have that as more of a passive recreation area um, with the active recreation being um, at Chisholm and, and the lakefront, but just kind of having this changing the deal some of a bit smaller of a bite. Cause it seems like this is 
this is kind of a large chunk for us to take down at once. Thank you. Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the chamber that is wanting to speak to this item? Mayor, I have um, one person that is here in the audience, one that wanted to read for the record and for residents online. Okay. We'll have them speak and they can read their statement into the record. Yes, sir. We have Betty Damke in the audience to speak. She will be coming to the podium. Okay. Good evening, everyone. First of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to come to you with some positive concerns and issues that we always have faced in the past. Uh, before I get into my little spiel for this, I'd like to address uh, what uh, Councilman Cooper brought up, uh, Chisholm Park versus, versus Hastings Ranch. Chisholm Park, and believe me, it's right in my backyard, is not really geared to generate revenue. Hastings Ranch does generate revenue. With the events that go on there, and they are multiple, so let's keep that factor in mind also. But as I said, it's a pleasure to come with some good news rather than a lot of concerns. And as you know, I represent our Narcusi Corridor group, which is comprised of over thousands of people, many of them who actually live in the city limits of St. Cloud. And keep in mind that when we say community, that includes the city and the county. Um, what goes on in one affects the other one. And when the Norcusi overlay was being formatted, one of the most important factors was, and still is, more public park facilities. And this is also a concern in your city, as you've witnessed through the past. The Hastings have presented to you a fantastic opportunity with the purchase, and our Narcusi group consistently supports this pr proposal. From a financial aspect, yeah, it's going to cost money. But this property is valued at a much greater value than the price that it's being asked. Our economy is rebounding and land values are soaring. Neglecting to approve this purchase would result in a very wasted opportunity. George and Debbie have assured us there is a clause in the agreement that the ranch will always remain a park open to the public. As Hastings Ranch, they have created a legacy for our community where many wonderful memories have been made for a variety of events. The ranch is a landmark of our community's heritage and it must remain as such. George has also informed me that the trails which are an integral part of the Narcusi overlay will be incorporated into the ranch. That's an additional asset. Rooftops are dominating our landscape and even personal residential yard space is being reduced. This accentuates the need for more open green spaces. Families need more options for outdoor recreation. I know from personal experience, the excellent opportunity the Hastings have for event planning to be held at the ranch. It will serve the city and the community well to utilize their knowledge, their expertise, and experience for future events. I urge you to give a unanimous vote to complete this purchase with a devout agreement to uphold the specifics for future generations. Don't waste a golden opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, was there, was there another statement you had to read? I have one for the record, and then I have four that are online to speak. Okay. okay. So the one for the record is from a Scott Cassidy at 2450 McMichael Road, St. Cloud, Florida. He states, as a 15-year property owner in the Narcusi rural area, I wanted to express enthusiastic support 
for the council's effort to secure the Hastings Ranch property for use as a community-based park and much needed green space in the area. With the explosive growth of subdivisions throughout this area, it is encouraging to see the council take advantage of the opportunity to secure Hastings Ranch, which will provide some breathing space amongst the housing, as well as ensure quality recreational space for the thousands of new families who are beginning to make this area home. This appears to be exactly the sort of project envisioned by the Florida Community Trust. Thank you in advance supporting, for supporting this effort. Thank you. Do we have someone to speak online? Yes, um, we have Jennifer Paul. Ms. Paul, are you online? Yes, good evening yes. to the Honorable Mayor Blackwell, Deputy Mayor Matheny, Council Members Cooper, Askew, and Trace. My name is Jennifer Paul, and I grew up in the Narcusi. I grew up in Narcusi my entire life. I am the fourth generation in the Paul family who resided here in 1952. As a St. Cloud resident now, I still spend majority of my time in Narcusi with my family. As a longtime resident, I have seen Narcusi come from dirt roads to pavement and orange groves to housing developments throughout the years. Narcusi is a refreshing neighborhood that is developing with new home growth rapidly. Residents would love to see a park rather than another housing development. Therefore, having a park would benefit everyone in the community and surrounding area. It would also benefit the economy and, pro and provide habitats for many animals. Major benefits to having a park, health. Parks encourage physical activity and staying, sustain health, healthy lifestyles, taking advantage of any walking paths surrounding the park, exploring the outdoor adventures of nature and wildlife. Parks help restore people from the stress of day-to-day -day challenges. Social connection, Parks provide gathering places for families, churches, and social groups, as well as individuals to gather for family and social events. Environment, if you can skip the car and just walk to the park in your area, you can save the gas and carbon emissions and stay local. Families can make the trip a learning experience with their kids by packing some garbage bags and spending a few minutes cleaning up any garbage you may find at the park. Teaching your kids it's their neighborhood and park to help keep it clean. Economic, consider the park as an economic development and not just a drain on the city budget. During trying times, parks can help families save money opposed to spending $200 per person at a Disney park for a family. Families can go to the park and play games, have a picnic, hike the trails, jog, canoeing, etc. Parks can draw visitors from near and far. Festivals can be held to bring additional boost to the local economy. This is just a handful of reasons why parks are important. Please consider this park opportunity at the Hastings Ranch in Narcusi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Mm -hmm. Madam Clark, do we have? Next, we have Timothy St. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, are you on? I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time and, and the meeting as well. Um, my name is Tim St. Gordon. I reside at 6205 Lake Lizzie Drive in St. Cloud. Um, while I am not a resident of the city of St. Cloud, um, I do have a business, a real estate brokerage in St. Cloud Commons, just on the west side of St. Cloud. And I've been here since 1993. Uh, <laughs> Lost you, Mr. Gordon. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay, I'm sorry. Proceed. Not sure. Not sure where I got cut off. Um, Talked about how long you had lived here. I think. Okay, thank you. So I'm a I'm a resident since 1993. I do not live in the city, but I am a very concerned resident. Um, also the president of the Alligator Lake Chain Alliance. Uh, Center Lake is approximately a half a mile from this site. And uh, we are concerned about what happens in the community. We realize that the, the area is growing. 
Uh, we realize what the urban growth boundary has done and is doing to our way of life out here. And I want to express support for this project, this purchase, uh, as for all the points that have already been made. Um, I would also like to point out, if I could, to the council that uh, the Florida Communities Trust also purchased the property right across the lake from me called the Lake Lizzie Preserve, which was 940 acres and is now a nature preserve that has done very, very well and is a, is a centerpiece for everyone in Osceola County and people that come here as well. Um, in 2004, there was a uh, an initiative that went on the ballot during a general election. It was called Save Osceola. And that was basically an initiative or a, an amendment that, that, um, that maybe my language isn't correct, but the Osceola County residents were asked to tax themselves to set aside green spaces for passive recreation and for conservation. Uh, this, this project went very well. It was uh, run by Kevin Schoolfield of Schoolfield Properties and Rob Dent, who was a, a, a nature guy, a tree hugger, I call him, which I'm partially guilty of that myself. Um, but anyway, this was in 2004 and it was on the ballot. In August of 2004, we had three hurricanes come through here. Francis, uh, Jean and uh, Charlie, which came through, I don't have them in order, but in November of that year, this initiative passed. After all that devastation, the residents of this county still voted on a two to one margin to tax themselves to preserve these lands. My point in that is that the residents of this area are very concerned about their quality of life. And I don't see any reason why this project shouldn't go through because it only does that to help preserve our quality of life here. So I don't have any financial stake in this. Um, I don't have any knowledge of who is benefiting or not benefiting from it, but I did hear about it and I support this. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Clark, who do we have next? Mayor, we have Eileen Lawson. Ms. Lawson, are you online? Yes, I am online now. Thank you. Will you have the floor? Please speak. Identify yourself and your address. Yes, my name is Eileen Lawson. I live at 3174 Waterbridge Lane. That's in the Fells Cove subdivision. Thank you. And, and I, too, am in total support of this. I have been coming to this area since the early 80s. I have watched this change from our beautiful space wonderful area and all I have seen is growth upon growth upon growth and I remember when it was just a blinking light there at Jones Road now it's a traffic light I remember when it was two lane and now it's four lane and now there's subdivisions everywhere they're coming more and more subdivisions our families are desperate for places that we can take our families as I heard someone say before we have to drive everywhere Hastings Ranch has that amazing fall festival. It is a, it can be a destination. And we desperately, desperately need to keep some of these green spaces so that we can teach our children about environmental things. Most of our children don't even understand where some of our food comes from because, you know, it comes from the grocery store. They have no concept of where anything comes from. And this is, can give such a learning opportunity for our children. We could have, you know, even modified in a small manner, a petting zoo, educational lectures for our children. But the opportunities that this is, presents are absolutely limitless. And I heard uh, them talk about Chisholm Park. Chisholm Park is a nice park, but it does not even begin to offer the opportunities that you have at Hastings Ranch, let alone as somebody else mentioned the uh, already revenue that's already there. So I really and truly ask you to please uh, consider this as a way to benefit our children and all our future growth. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Madam Clerk, did we have one other, did you say? Correct, um, Jackie Eagleston, Bear Eagleton. Ms. Eagleton, are you with us? Ms. Eagleton. Can you hear me? I can now. Sorry about that, bad, bad reception out here. Good evening, Mayor Blackwell and all council members. My name is Jackie Eggleton, and I live and I've lived and raised my children in St. Cloud for 30 years now. I live in the Narcusi area. I'm calling in today to share with all the members our support for the city to please preserve the Hastings Ranch for our community. This beautiful, rare, preserved green space is an endless asset to our community. For many years now, the ranch has been there for many years now, already serving our local community as a great outdoor venue for various events. Over the years, I have heard from hundreds of our residents of how much they love this preserved land and how much they enjoy bringing their families out to the ranch for the various events. This ranch is a safe space for families to gather, like taking an evening walk after work or school, or just walking your dog, riding your bikes, enjoying the quality time outside with your family and friends, and most of all, enjoying nature. Due to our recent and continued growth of the new homes and businesses in our area, the preservation of this ranch is urgent need in our area. We all need to make sure that our community has an even balance of homes, businesses, and priceless natural parks. As we all have realized in the last several months, how important it is to have these outdoor green spaces to enjoy exercise, both for our physical and our mental health. We all have seen a lot of changes in our area. Grow, our growing St. Cloud community and some of the changes we've had have not been a positive for our residents. But I can say that the preservation of the Hastings Ranch is a definite positive for our residents and our community. This, this um, is what we need in our community, and I think we all can agree on that. So as we grow and change for the best quality communities we can offer, it is our responsibility to make sure that we preserve the Hastings Ranch land for many generations to come for our children, our grandchildren, and all the generations to come. This will benefit our community for many generations. This is our duty to our residents of our community to indefinitely preserve this land. We have a rare opportunity right now to acquire this land for a great market value. That's an, that is amazing in today's market. So I would like to thank all of you for listening to our concerns. Mayor Blackwell, Deputy Mayor Matheny, Council Member Askew, Council Member Cooper, and Council Member Trace. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Jackie. We don't have anyone else to speak, do we? Mayor, we have no one else to speak in online or in person. Well, I don't see anybody's line. I'd like to speak. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, all the staff that have worked on this, especially Ms. Colazzo putting together all of those numbers. Uh, it's obviously a, you put a lot of work into that. Uh, I am certainly personally in favor of making this purchase, if at all possible. You know, when one of the big things I think we always regret was is looking back over our shoulder years later and saying, boy, we should have bought that, but now it's gone. Uh, I like the fact that it has the potential to generate income that at least uh, would break even on its maintenance, but I think it even has greater possibility than that. I, I do share the concerns that if we do not secure this grant, uh, I think we're gonna have to take another hard look. You know, are we really ready uh, to, to bite that bullet. But what we have before us at this time 
in this resolution is moving forward with this grant application in hopes of securing it so that we can purchase this property. And, and I would like to see us move forward with uh, the approval of uh, at least seeing if we can secure uh, this grant application. Um, and so I move the adoption of resolution 2020-238R to proceed with the adoption or the application for this grant. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Askew, would you like to speak to this before we go any further? Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm in favor. Um, there's tons of reasons why, um, but uh, I don't think we're going to get this opportunity to ever get a land like this again. And, you know, this isn't like Nolte Road where I have this huge um, bill I have to pay every year, and I didn't make that decision. This bill, at least there's going to be some income coming in for it. So at least it's a, a generator of my income. I mean, it's probably going to take 10 years to make any money off it, but in 10 years, it's still going to look beautiful, and there's not going to be a ton of houses still. I'm still in favor of this project. Hopefully we can get the grant, and I don't know if that would be a Dan Manzera's question. Um can you, is there a way to write the contract and um, contingency of the, the grant is approved? I'm not sure when that'll happen. I'll probably be in the spring, I would assume. We can certainly work on that, Mr. Askew, and see, I'm not sure the, uh, uh, well, I don't sure yeah. how the seller is going to respond to that. Right. right. It's just an idea. Oh, actually, it's uh, Mr. Trace's idea. Mr. Trace, would you like to speak to this? Um, do we have an estimated date of when the grant award would come out? April. May Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may, Ms. Plaza. Leslie Flores. Oh, Leslie, I'm sorry. <laughs> Leslie Flores, Procurement Services Director. Um, the projected funding is April to May of 2021. Wow. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor Blackwell, as yes, part of your motion or direction, would you want to give um, city manager direction on how you want to handle the contract with the seller? Well, I think he needs to bring back to us uh, proposals on uh, the creative financing of the property, if that's what we end up having to do um, for consideration. I certainly would like to, uh, I would like to be able to know whether or not we're going to get this grant before we pull the trigger or at least give us time to think about it and bring it back before us again. Is that a possibility? Mayor, may be recognized? Yes, you may, Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, sir. That was my intent to get this discussion tonight, at least get some forward direction. Um, we could bring back <clears throat> a few more details and a contract back and we can discuss with the seller. And it would be fine. Yeah, you know, be a final decision before the due diligence period ends. Okay. Would Would that be acceptable, Mr. Trace? It's It's your motion. Up to you. Well, I just want to know. I, I'm perfectly I'm fine to, with. I'm willing to move forward with that motion if you can bring us we make a, a final decision on the. Uh, we get to look at what you're proposing on a final contract. I'm going to entertain any, any other discussion. Council member, um, Mr. Cooper had his light off first. Go ahead, Mr. Cooper. <clears throat> I think Mr. Trace had uh, brought up the question of could we buy just a portion of it? Could we put that in the contract or at least let's see if we could do that instead of purchasing all of it? That way it would cut down your expense, bring some of it to where that uh, the city wouldn't have to pay that much. It would be already paid for by the grants and everything else. I'm not in favor of adding that to my motion at this point. Unless you're wanting to make an amendment. If you'd make an amendment to it, yes. Somebody. Councilmember Matheny. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't like the idea of buying a portion of it either. I just feel like that's not going to work. And, you know, I, I just, I don't still see how that would work. I mean, um, I definitely want us to come back and have a conversation because uh, Mr. Manzara said October 8th, they could bring something back with the contract. I just don't know. And I, I don't know, but you know, I, I really would like to have this property. I agree with all of the callers and everyone that's there. I mean, I've been an advocate for this since the, since the beginning. I just, this isn't going to, you know, we're not going to get this opportunity again. Um, and we do have the funding in our park and rec budget. We can cover it. I just feel like this is what the money's for. I mean, this is what the money is for it's, is to preserve this land. I like the idea of Ms. Colazzo presented where we possibly give like a down payment, a larger down payment, and then we do the um, the leasing terms following that. I don't know how that impacts um, grant applications and can you repay yourself if you've already paid or, you know, whatever. I'll let the finance people figure that out. But I feel like this is a, this is a great opportunity for the city and um, I just feel like we're going to waste it. And um, I doubt that the, the seller is going to sit and hold for another six plus months to figure out whether we get the grant or not. I just don't right. see that happening with the way people are trying to gobble up land. Um, so I definitely want to move forward with the grant application, but I, I would like to have another discussion prior to the end of the due diligence myself. May I be right? Yes, you may, Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, I just want to uh, clarify that, yes, we can supplant the money if we're awarded the grant. That money could be put back into the impact fee fund for Parks and Rec. Okay, but well, I certainly, you know, my motion is just move forward with the application, and but it will be brought back before the due diligence for us to consider again for final approval. Is that, is that acceptable? Mr. Manzaris. Yes, sir. And just to clarify, it's our intent to bring this back at your next council meeting. Um, okay. Well, that'll give us some time to, to think about it a little bit further because it's, uh, uh, I think it's something we certainly need to move forward with, but we certainly need to make sure that we, we, we've really thought this through. Madam Clerk, can you call the roll? Mayor, I also um, just wanted to mention Hello. Dirk Webb has raised his hand to Hello. speak. Battery, please charge. Dirk, uh, I'll allow Dirk to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought I was registered to speak to this uh, case, but apparently not. Um, very short comment. Uh, Quality of life is very important to every chamber and every chamber exec, especially with the, the idea of it being a perpetual park. And so the St. Cloud Chamber of Commerce supports this opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll now? Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council Member Cooper. As long as it dies, as long as it ties in with the getting the money, aye. <laughs> Councilmember Askew, aye. Councilmember Trace, aye. Mayor Blackwell, aye. Motion carries five zero. Mr. Manzaris, what do you have for us? I do not have anything, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our city manager, Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to recognize Fire Chief Joe Silvestres to talk about a special event tomorrow honoring our firefighters. Chief Silvestres. Mr. Silvestres. Well, I think you're out there somewhere. There you are. Sorry, Mayor, my computer was having some issues. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, tomorrow, our team, uh, C-Shift specifically, who's on duty tonight, is going to be recognized at the Patriots Breakfast that happens every year in remembrance of 9-11. Uh, and they're being recognized 
of heroic efforts that they did at the Foster Fire on Georgia Avenue uh, earlier this year. And uh, in attendance will be the whole team. So it'll be a, a very nice um, honoring of their efforts uh, at 9-11. It's usually a really big event when there's a lot of VIPs that kind of scaled it down because of the COVID. Um, but it's going to be televised on Orange TV and uh, YouTube. So hopefully we'll be able to archive it. And uh, I was working with Mary Emma to hopefully get it on um, our web page and social media pages. So maybe we can see it during uh, some live efforts. But it starts tomorrow at 8. Um, and uh, it's a big deal for St. Cloud and St. Cloud Fire Rescue. And uh, the guys did an amazing job. Thank you very much. We uh, look forward to being a part of that. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Sturgeon, you have anything else? No, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Councilman Cooper. You are muted. You need to unmute your mic. Thank you. Mr. Sturgeon. One more time. When do you think we're going to get uh, downtown some sound system? It is on the agenda for the 24th. I need like that answer. It's on the next agenda to approve the money for that. Okay. And I guess the last question is about flooding the manhole covers on the west west of the grid. Yes, tell sir. Me what, tell me what we're doing to repair and fix this thing. Are we yep. flushing? Are you flushing out? Hang on a second. Are you flushing out these lines? Are going to be flushing them or, or sucking out the sand out of there? Yeah, we put a uh, a multiple department task force together today, and I'm going to have Marjorie Craig and Nassim talk to that. I'll have Nassim talk about the flooding in general, and then I'll have Miss Craig talk about what we're doing for the the uh, wastewater backup. So Nassim, if you could okay. just talk a few minutes what our actions have been so far. Oh uh, yes, sir. This is a Nassim Public Works Department. Uh, in regards to uh, the flooding, yesterday uh, we uh, we received about a 4.37 inch rain event in about uh, a short time period, uh, within about an hour uh, hour or so. Uh, it was a uh, it was shown on the news, Channel Nine News, uh, documented on that. Um, so that uh, that that type of uh, rain event compounded with uh, the several days of rain that we've been receiving. Our, as you know, uh, our our flood uh, excuse me, our stormwater system is a combination of underground uh, or open open swales, underground piping, as well as uh, percolation uh, absorption through the groundwater. And our groundwater system has been uh, very saturated, which unfortunately uh, affects not just our, uh, you know, the ability to drain, but also affects other types of utilities on that. Um, after the storm event uh, yesterday, uh, excuse me, during the storm event yesterday, we closed down a couple, uh, two streets in the historical grid being Alabama, as well as California uh, and around the 11th Street, uh, 11th Street block. Uh, but they were reopened shortly uh, within 30 minutes to allow traffic to go through. So it was really closed down as a precaution. Uh, so, which was in a good indication of uh, the storm water system uh, draining uh, through uh, because we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, extensive uh, maintenance and as well as inspection around this around the area. Uh, so that's uh, in terms of the flooding. Uh, I'll let Marjorie Craig talk uh, specifically about the utilities. Marjorie. Hi, this is Marjorie Craig, uh, Environmental Utilities Department Director. And uh, uh, I've been talking to residents, uh, gathered staff. We've been uh, trying to figure out the cause of uh, what appears to be uh, inflow of stormwater into the sanitary sewer system. So, um, and the amount of water, just to put it in perspective, because we've 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 tried to come up with some creative ideas uh, to fill a, an Olympic-sized swimming pool every three hours. Um, so, an Olympic-sized swimming pool holds, I think, about four hundred and sixty thousand gallons, something like that. It's about uh, over 5 million gallons a day, and that's probably an underestimate. So there's, there's stormwater coming from somewhere and it's infiltrating the sewer system. Um, so we are, I've got, I brought in a hydraulic expert, uh, outside of hydraulic expert and field experts, two of the best that I know in the state. And I've been in the, I'm, I don't even want to tell you how many years I've been in utilities. I'll just tell you, I started when I was a small child, um, and we're working really hard. Um, 
we care about this. We don't want this to happen. And uh, we're trying to fix it as soon as we can. Um, so we're trying to isolate the issue. We've been talking to customers. We've doing, been doing field reconnaissance and working in public works as uh, we're working hand in hand with public works uh, with the PIO office to make sure we get the information out to let people know what we're doing. And uh, with parks and with procurement, uh, with the fire department, um, did I miss one's on the scene? With everybody working as a team because we, uh, we want to get this solved uh, as soon as possible. So in, until we find the cause of that, when it rains, we're, uh, we, we've just been seeing those high levels in the sewer system. It, you know, I don't want to say that every time it rains, there's like a two hour delay, but there's, there's a some level delay. And it seems like it might not be related to this, this, the wet weather or the storm, but it, but it is. Um, so we are working as hard as we can to, to get that resolved. Okay, but this is running through the sewer system. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're treating it and it's going to, I mean, it's just millions of gallons that we're just losing every time it rains. We need to get this fixed like ASAP. It's a priority. The city managers made a priority. It's been clear that each one of the city council members have made it a priority. And we are, I mean, we are seriously working on this uh, nonstop to fix it. Could you bring at the next meeting, bring something back, Mr. Sturgeon, that will tell us what you're doing or where we're at? Yes, sir. And then, and then along the way, we'll give you updates um, in the interim also via email or phone calls. I, I just want to compliment my team. Um, we knew we had a serious issue and the team came together. Um, they had uh, 10 people out working a day trying to solve the problem and uh, they've done a great job and, and Nassim's did a great job. We did an after action review after the flooding we had on Alabama. We've worked with the FDOT. We're working with the South Florida Water Management District to talk about lake levels. We're, we're looking at every aspect of our system to see how we can fix this. So uh, my team's done a great job. I'm very proud of them, but I will keep you guys in the loop for sure. Yes, sir. I, I really appreciate that. I think they've done a good job as best as they can, but then we're going to have to go beyond that, I think. So yeah, I'll absolutely. do that as soon as we can. I sure appreciate it. <laughs> absolutely. That's it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Scooter. Thank you, Councilman Cooper. Councilmember Trace. Thank you, Mayor. Um, two things I want to bring up. Uh, first one is during our budget review yesterday as part of that um, the, the letter, uh, it mentioned only $38,000 out of the $250,000 of um, support grants, the COVID support grants that we put out have been allocated. Um, maybe not necessarily if you guys aren't prepared for this meeting, but is there anything we can do to help get those out in the community better? Is there requirements that are onerous or is that not geared towards everyone that can apply for it? Um, because with it being out there for a couple of months, it seems like we we would have gone through a lot more of that, those funds. Mayor, may we recognize? Yes, you may. Yes, sir. On the next agenda, I was reviewing agenda prep today. We're going to remove the restric restriction of the PPP requirement. We think that'll start the money flowing because that's been a requirement, you know. And then I still owe you a, a level two, or I'm sorry, phase two. We haven't really come to a conclusion how we're going to disperse some of that money for commercial. So we'll bring that back next meeting. Okay, so we'll have um, on the agenda, we'll have specific language to modify that um, the yes. phase one stuff, recommendations on phase two. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And then um, on both of our public hearing um, or two of our public hearing items tonight, there were, there were items that I, I have specific issue with that are on main frontage roads, two items that um, have uses that I don't, I don't believe are appropriate on some of these frontage roads. I know, uh, we gave the planning department, Andre's team, um, direction to do a overlay code frontage and overlay code for 192, um, which allows or, or doesn't allow certain uses along within a certain distance of 192. Um, I was wondering if we could give some direction to kind of set up, uh, some of the framework streets, Canoe Creek, Old Canoe Creek possibly Michigan, um, Nolte, you know, some of these major highways that 
you know, maybe we don't have schools or charter schools on some of those roads. Maybe we don't have storage on some of those roads. Maybe we don't have certain items that cause known issues um, on some of those areas. So I just kind of wanted to get everyone's uh, input on that. Yeah. Are there any objections? I see thumbs everywhere, so that's a that's all I need. Okay. And and it could be specific to the roads. One I two maybe is a wider buffer than some of the other roads, but just you know, if there's commercial areas, let's um, keep those commercial and and keep those allowances there. But then now we've got agricultural uses that now we can get conditional uses that you can do a gas station essentially. But yeah, it's just a different different item. So. Um, Thank you, and I hope everyone stays uh, healthy and safe. Thank you. Councilmember Askew. I have nothing, Mayor. I appreciate everybody um, and uh, hang in there with the COVID. Councilmember Matheny. Um, I had a couple items, but Mr. Cooper covered them, the flooding and the sewer. I know um, ever since 192, the last time 192 went underwater, I know a house on Tennessee can't flush their toilets every single time it rains. So something has gone amiss for, you know, it's like, well, no flushing the toilets for two days. Um, so, um, you know, I appreciate all the hard work the staff's doing to try to un unwind whatever problem is occurring. And um, I totally agree about the, the the roads and the schools. I mean, that was my point tonight, where it's like nothing screws a, ro a road up better than sticking a school on it. We all see it. Um, and uh, just everyone have a, a safe weekend. And um, that's all I got. Thank you. I would also like to thank the staff for the extensive work that they've done going the extra mile addressing the flooding and and uh, the sewer issues uh, you you guys have done an excellent job and i certainly look forward to seeing you guys solve helping us come to some conclusions on how we can solve some of these issues so we're not uh, having to keep dealing with it when we're in a storm season uh, i also had the privilege of making uh, presenting a proclamation of thanks and appreciation to the saint cloud police department uh, for their outstanding work over the last 10 years, there's been a 37% drop in the crime rate in uh, St. Cloud. And I know that is due to the excellent leadership, the training they've given, the equipment that our council has helped furnish. And, the, uh, and I believe the positive support of our residents. And I just wanted to send out another thanks to our St. Cloud Police Department and our Chief Gauntlet uh, for their leadership and uh, thank them for what they've done to help keep our city safe. Again, I uh, wish all of you the best, stay healthy, and uh, thank you for being a part of our council meeting tonight. Brings us to our information section and report section. Thursday, September the 24th, 2020, there'll be a Stevens Plantation Dependent Special District meeting at 6 p.m. and that will be a virtual meeting. Thursday, September 24th, there will be a city council meeting following that at 6.30 or in, as soon as the Stevens uh, DSD meeting is completed, and that will be virtual also. We've issued a number of proclamations this week, a proclamation recognition of National Payroll Week. Uh, and we thank all of the staff that certainly uh, serves in that department. We made proclamation recognition of Stormwater Awareness Week. Proclamation Recognition of National Pollution Prevention Week and a Proclamation Recognition of St. Cloud Police Department Appreciation Week that I've already referred to. Uh, reports are available, warrant list number 17 and Recreation Advisory Committee minutes for July uh, 2020 have been approved and are available for your review. With that, we have no other business. We will be adjourned. Thank you.